text this morning is from Mark, Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, starting at verse 13. These are the words of God. And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that had brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. Our Father and gracious God, I pray that your spirit would be present here with us today. I pray that our hearts would be as open as our Bibles are. I pray that you would work in us. I pray that you teach and instruct us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is an occasional sermon, meaning a topical sermon, uh, and it has to do with this particular period in our congregation's history. This is a remarkable, uh, m- remarkable time in our congregation's history. We've never seen growth like this before, and all of us are getting used to a new situation. Now, of course, those of you, and there are many of you who have moved across the country to join us, welcome. You are most welcome. In one sense, you may be refugees, but in another more fundamental sense, you are actually reinforcements. This is a new community for you, a new setting, a new set of friends, the works. Your experience of church is very different than what it was before. But the same thing is also true of all you old timers. You are attending a very different church also. This is not the same as it was. This is a different situation Altogether, we are all of us in a new situation, and this is the situation that God has given to us. And as with all of God's gifts, we want to be faithful with what God has given to us. Now, believe it or not, for many of you, there are some things about Christ Church that take some getting used to. Some of them are trivial, and some of them are practices that we consider to be very important. You may have checked it out, you may have done your research online, you may have done all of that stuff, and then you arrive here and you're looking around and and something hits you that you never thought to ask about. Consider this message as an orientation to one of our doctrinal assumptions that we believe to be crucial, and it is the one that has to do with the relationship of our children to our congregation. It has to do with the relationship of our children to our congregation. Now, in the passage I just read from Mark chapter 10, this is a passage that is recorded in all three synoptic gospels. It's also recorded in Matthew 19, 13 through 15. It's recorded in Luke 18, uh, verse 15, verses 15 through 17. This is recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels. It is a very famous incident. Young children were brought to Jesus so that he might touch them. That's, the, that's why they were brought. Would you, th- these parents or these uh, guardians, the people carrying the children, were bringing them to Jesus so that Jesus might touch them. What touching meant to Jesus in these passages is seen in how he responded. He took the children into his arms, we're told. He placed his hands on them. It says that he blessed them. That's in verse 16. Took them into his arms, placed his hands on them, and he spoke a blessing over them. In Matthew, it says that he laid hands on them. That's Matthew 19, 15. In the Luke account, we see that coming to Jesus can be accomplished when someone else carries you there because the word used of children there is brephos, the word for infants. So the brephos, infants, came to Jesus. How can an infant come to Jesus? Well, somebody carries them. Someone carries them to Jesus, and when the infant is carried to Jesus, that infant is coming to Jesus. In that instance, there's no difference between coming and being brought. Now, in all three accounts, the disciples were busy grown-ups, and they rebuked those who brought the children. As you can see, the rabbi is a very busy man. In the Mark account, it says that Jesus was greatly displeased with this. All right, we should take note, when, the, when you're reading through the Gospels and it says Jesus was greatly displeased with something, you, what do you think of? You think of the cleansing of the temple or rebuking a Pharisee. Well, it has to do with uh, the disciples and the little kids. 
If you want to get that kind of reaction from Christ, then try to get in between him and a child being brought to him. If you want that kind of reaction from Jesus, get in between Christ and a child being brought to Christ. In all three accounts, Jesus requires us to allow the children to be brought to him. Now, the reason he gives for this standard is that of such is the kingdom of God. That's in verse 14. In other words, Jesus, does, Jesus doesn't just say something like, hey, come on, guys, I like kids. He says, of such is the kingdom of God. He gives a doctrinal theological rationale for this. He does not say anything like, well, after all, ch children are a theology-free zone. Children are not a theology-free zone. And in addition to all of that, he teaches us that children do not have to become more like adults to come. It's the other way around. Rather, adults need to become more like children in order to enter the kingdom. That's in verse 15. Children don't have to become more like adults to come to Christ. Adults have to become more like children to come to Christ. Like the, like the disciples in the story, we often get this backwards. Now, why is this relevant? Some quick background on, on our practice here. You will have noticed that our children gather to worship the Lord together with the rest of us. We have a service that includes the entire family. Occasionally, a family member can't make it, somebody's sick at home, or a child has to be escorted out for an attitude adjustment or something like that. But by and large, 99% of us are here in the worship service for the whole worship service. We don't have a separate children's church, for example. We all gather together. Your children, if, if you're new here, your children are most welcome, fidgets and all. Your children are welcome and their fidgets are welcome. All right, your children are welcome, all of you are welcome. On those occasions, when you need to deal with what might be called moral disorder that is broken out in your row, then you can feel free to escort your child outside. But that's the sort of thing that we take in stride. And pretty much everyone here has been in your shoes. So this is not something where everybody's saying sharp intake of breath, <laughs> looks uh, squinty-eyed at the person who had a misbehaving child. Can you imagine a misbehaving child at church? <laughs> yes, every week I see it. The keys to the kingdom, however, are held by the elders of the church and not by the fathers. Fathers and mothers don't hold the keys to the kingdom. This is a, a distinct and separate institution. There's the institution that God has established of civil government. There is the institution of um, uh, church government. And there's the institution of family government. Word and sacraments are not entrusted primarily to the family. Families are supposed to be faithful to the word. They're supposed to be faithful and remind the children, parents, uh, take a vow when the uh, child is baptized to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's scriptural, but the elders are responsible for the word and sacrament. It's the responsibility of our elders, of our session of elders, to guard the purity of the word and the integrity of the sacraments. If your child is baptized, he is welcome to come to the table together with the rest of us. If your baptized child is three months old and conked out in the car seat, don't feel like you have to wake them up for the supper. We are covenantal, not superstitious. All right, we are covenantal, not superstitious. Your child is baptized. They're welcome to come to the table. But if they're conked out, don't worry about it. You don't wake them up for a good point in the sermon, right? <laughs> Maybe you ought to, but you don't. <laughs> but I don't see you doing that. But when, you're, but when your child is on your lap, tracking with the service and he notices the tray going by, and he wants to partake, don't, please don't restrain him. But at the same time, because this is not a unilateral family decision, please let your parish elder know that your child is now partaking. All right, this is because we want accountability from the families to the church, and we want everyone to recognize that this oversight of the Lord's table, oversight of the sacraments, is the responsibility of the church. And if you have a child who is not baptized, but who believes in Jesus, he is still welcome to the table with us, but he should be baptized first. He is welcome to sit at table with us, but the way to the dining room table is through the front door, which is baptism. So uh, there are, in, in evangelicalism in North America, there are all kinds of odd combinations, and there are Baptists who, who have unbaptized children 
who are pedo communionists their, their children are partaking of communion, but the children are not baptized. It should be baptism and then the Lord's Supper. Baptism and then the Lord's Supper. Now, a little more local history. We have in this congregation what we call a baptismal cooperation agreement. The Confession of Faith for Christ Church is the Westminster Confession. The Westminster Confession is a um, pedo baptist document. The Westminster Con Confession upholds and argues for the propriety of and the biblical necessity for baptizing infants. That's the Westminster Confession, and that's our Confession of Faith. But in addition to that, we have worked out what we call a baptismal cooperation agreement, which stipulates for an allowed exception. Someone can come and join the church, someone with Baptist convictions can come and join the church and not be paedo baptist in other words. So, for about 25 years, we have successfully navigated and allowed for our differences on baptism. And this sermon doesn't represent a change in that. So we've worked out our, uh, a way of navigating our differences on baptism. The church is formally paedo baptist You just saw a, a, a child baptized this morning. We do that in the service. We embrace it in our confession of faith. But we've worked out a, a, a place for uh, believers with Baptist convictions to hold to those convictions and practice them while still being uh, among us, still being members with us. So those differences are differences between Presbyterian and Baptist, Reformed Presbyterian and Reformed Baptist. But at the same time, this is, and this is the point of the message, at the same time, we've also cultivated a church community that is a welcoming place for the children, all the children. We want this to be a welcoming place for the children, all the children. This issue is related to the doctrine of baptism, but it's not identical with it. One of the things we want to insist on is that all of you, whether Presbyterian or Baptist or something else, that all of you learn to join with us in welcoming the children. That is crucial. Well, that's the thing that we want to hang on to. Now, some of you newcomers come from generic Baptist backgrounds, and others come from a more defined or robust Reformed Baptist background. You are most welcome here, but to get straight to the point, so are your kids. You are most welcome here, but so are your kids. We can accommodate differences on baptism, but we don't want to accommodate ungodly extrapolations from Baptist premises, or from Presbyterian premises for that matter. So every, even, if a, even if a doctrine is biblical, you can reason in unbiblical ways from those premises. If the, obviously, if I'm the minister here and we have the confession of faith that's Westminster, I believe that paedo baptism is good and right and biblical. But just because the doctrine itself is good, right, and biblical doesn't mean that you can't reason unbiblically from it. And if, um, if you have conscientious Baptist parents who I believe are mistaken about the doctrine of baptism, they can, re they can reason correctly from an incorrect premise, or they can reason incorrectly from it. And it's the downstream cultural uh, things that I'm concerned about here. So what would be an example of reasoning unbiblically from Presbyterian uh, convictions. An example of that would be, yes, he's serving five to ten for armed robbery, but he's a good boy. He, he was baptized once, and we are hopeful that something worthwhile will kick in sometime. There's no sign of it, there's no indication of it, but we're going to trust in a little ritual down in front of the church. Uh, that is an un unbiblical reasoning, because Everything is animated in the Christian faith, in the New Covenant. Everything is animated by faith and by faith alone. It's the preaching of the Word that is animated by faith. You, it, the Word doesn't do any good. It just bounces off the walls and bounces off foreheads unless it's heard with faith. So a sermon does no good unless it's heard with faith. Bread and wine do no good unless they're received with faith. The water applied does no good unless it is received with faith. So if you're just trusting in the ceremony, which many Pado baptist uh, Christians have been tempted to, to do and have done, if you're just trusting in the ceremony by itself, you're trusting in water, not in Jesus. You're trusting in bread and wine and not in Jesus. You're trusting in church membership and not in Jesus. So what would be the example of a Reformed Baptist cultural thing that we're trying to resist? 
An example of that would be, Daddy, I do love Jesus. And then Dad replies, let us be the judge of that kid. Don't you remember that lie you told three years ago? You're a sinner. <laughs> I know, but I confess my I know, but I got spanked. I know, but it was all you said it was all right. You said it was all done. We sometimes have, many times adults, being busy grown-ups like the disciples, have their thumb on the scales when it, it's a double, uh, it's uh, unequal weights and measures when it comes to evaluating the profession of your friends, fellow adults, and evaluating the profession of your kids. If you are concerned about your child being baptized, if, if, you, if your child says, I love Jesus, can I be baptized? And you're saying, I'm not so sure because... Back home where we used to do it, nobody was baptized before they were 15 or so. That's the, that's, the, that's the cultural expectation. But that's not what we want to do. If you're concerned about your child being baptized because you are not absolutely sure that he is truly converted, think of it this way. We're not sure that you are truly conver converted, and we let you in. <laughs> right? What do we... The elder, Well, they, you checked, you asked... All we know when someone comes in and we just moved from just moved from this state across the country and you asked us a few questions and we answered them correctly. Um, I have, if, let, let's say I am uh, baptizing an infant that is the fifth or sixth infant of a family that has lived here for 20 years and all the other kids are walking with the Lord. I have a lot more certainty about this child that I'm uh, baptizing than I do of someone that I just met three weeks ago. Right? But on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people believed, and what day were they baptized on? Same day. Right? There, no background checks. No background checks. Now, do you, is it possible that among those 3,000, there were people who were tracking something in? There were people who were just getting on the bandwagon? Is that a possibility? That's absolutely a possibility. But that's that's a scriptural pattern. The scriptural, uh, the, the pattern of scripture is not to investigate, investigate, investigate. It's not to go after someone's confession of faith with a hermeneutic of suspicion. Your task as a Christian parent is not to sow doubts in your children. Your task is to teach them to believe. If your child says, I believe in Jesus, you, your task is not to say, are you sure? Let me test that. Let's, let's run you through your apologetics questions. That's not, how you, that's not how you instill faith. That's how you instill doubt. That's how you instill the reflex of doubt. I believe in Jesus. Oh, maybe I don't. Maybe I don't believe in it. Maybe I'm not believing hard enough. Maybe I'm not believing deep enough. Maybe I'm not believing good enough. Your, ta your task is to welcome the children. Now, there's one other thing. Let's, uh, and some of you may have heard me use this comparison before, and it, you have to use it uh, carefully, right? You want to make sure, but the difference, be, let's say there's a Baptist church uh, and a Presbyterian church, and they both, they both want to have, they both want to honor God, they both want to have a membership that honors God and the, that lives reflect a love of Jesus Christ. Compare it to a Baptist nightclub and a Presbyterian nightclub. Let's say you've got two nightclubs, and they both, the owners of the nightclubs both want to have a classy joint. They both want a nice, well-behaved joint. The Baptist nightclub hires security guards, people to check ID at the door. And they check ID at the door three times to make sure that they don't let riffraff in. That's how the Baptist nightclub keeps a classy joint. The Presbyterian nightclub does it by hiring big bouncers. They, they don't check you at the door, but if you come in and start to disrupt things, if you start to disobey every one of the Ten Commandments, if you start to live in a wild and dissolute way, then church discipline is applied. The bouncers remove you. Both want to have a church that honors God. The problem is, if you're checking ID for your three-year-old and your four-year-old and your five-year-old, if you're checking ID constantly, you're not only checking their ID, you're teaching them something. You're teaching them to doubt their love for Christ. And we want, to, we want to encourage you. I want to exhort you. I want to admonish you to not do that. Don't sow doubts in your children. Your task is to teach them to believe. So this is not a religion club that meets on Sunday. 
It's not a theology society that meets on Sunday. We are the body of Christ, and we're coming, and so, and that means coming to worship the Father here means that we are coming to and through Christ. When we worship, when we gather together as a body, we are coming to Christ, and we're coming to the Father through Christ. So when we gather in worship, when the, word, when the words are spoken at the beginning of the service, and we say, come, let us worship the triune God, we are coming to Christ, and we are coming through Christ to the Father. We come to the Father in the power of the Spirit, traveling the road, who is Christ. We are traveling Christ the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. I am the road. Christ says, I am the road, the truth, and the life. We're traveling Christ the way all together. And as we travel that way, we want to take great care not to place any stumbling block in that road for any of our little ones. We want to take great care not to put a stumbling block in that road for any of our little ones. In the previous chapter in the Gospel of Mark, what does Jesus say? Mark 9, 42. He says, and, and whosoever shall, of, shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. If anyone stumbles, if anyone offends a little one who believes in Christ, it's better for him that a millstone be hanged around his neck and he were cast into the sea. That, that's a terrifying statement. And we ought to pay more attention to it than we do. So quite apart from the doctrine of baptism itself, it's related, obviously, but quite apart from the doctrine of baptism itself, it's therefore a baseline assumption for our congregation here that it would be far, far better for us to admit a false professor into our membership than it would be to exclude a true brother. We would 10 times rather admit a false Christian than to reject a true Christian. If a true Christian wants to come and worship Christ together with us, and the Holy Spirit is with him, he's a brother, he professes faith, we want to receive him, and we want to receive him no matter how tall he is. We want, it's not, the Christian faith is not like a ride at Disneyland where you have to be a certain height or weight to participate. We want to receive him. This is the, this is the reflex, this is how the, the, the biblical view of justice and mercy uh, function together in Scripture. It would be far better, it'd be far better to let a guilty man go free in the criminal justice uh, system than to execute an innocent man. Executing an innocent man is far worse than letting a guilty man get away with it. Because there's the last judgment. God's going to settle all accounts at the end of it. We don't have to intervene with every last detail. And the tie goes in the, in the uh, freedom direction. We, we want to receive everyone who comes. We want to receive everyone who comes. We want to receive all the little ones who come. We want to receive all the little ones who are growing up in Reformed Baptist Households. Now, if you have a Reformed Baptist household and they say, well, we, we just don't see in Scripture this paedo baptism. We conscientiously believe that, that you should wait until a child is capable of making a profession of faith of their own. Uh, do you believe in Jesus? Can, if you say to a three year old, do you believe in Jesus? They can say yes or no, right? You can say, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I do. Do you intend to follow him? Yes, I do. That's that everything, uh, everything that the Reformed Baptist position requires is there. All right. So and we're not and we've resolved not to fight about that. But what we don't want is a child in your home to be growing up and have 10 years of being told no, 10 years of adults getting between them and the table, 10 years of adults get, saying the, the rabbi is a very busy man. That is how you get Jesus to be greatly displeased with your congregation. And that's not a good thing for Christian congregations. You don't want the head of the church to be greatly displeased with our carrying on with what we're doing. So this is an assumption that we want to see cultivated throughout the congregation. And this is because we don't want Christ to be greatly displeased with us. If I can speak autobiographically here, this is not, this is not something that was introduced 
uh, after the church began accepting paid baptism. That happened in the early 90s. But the church, this church was established in the mid-70s. This church was planted in the mid-70s. And we have sought to be welcoming to children the entire time. We've sought to be welcoming to children the entire time. There were doctrinal things to work out, but you can have doctrinal differences on baptism, paedobaptism, credo-baptism, paedobaptism. You can differ on that and still be welcoming the children. We want you children, I want to speak to those little ones here directly. We want you to feel like this is your church. We want you to look around at all the grown-ups and think, these are my people. These are my people. This is my church. I'm growing up in this church, and they're encouraging me, exhorting me, teaching me how to believe in Jesus and how to walk with him. And you might say, but, and, and this is where our assumptions from the Enlightenment come in. You say, well, but see, this two-year-old, he doesn't know anything, right? <laughs> kind of like the rest of us. I don't think this child understands the Lord's Supper as well as he should. I don't understand the Lord's Supper as well as, as we should. Nobody understands the Lord's Supper as well as we should. So when, when you say, I, I, don't, I don't think that this child could pass a theology exam. I don't think this child could pass a, a, a minor quiz on all the details of what the Lord's Supper means. So isn't it hazardous? to baptize them and bring them to Christ this way. No. When you, when you first bring your baby home from the hospital, when you, brand new baby, and you're, you should be thinking thoughts when the nurse hands you the baby, you should be thinking things like, if it's your first baby, is this allowed? <laughs> is there, here's an immortal soul. Take, take him home. Good luck. And you say, is this okay? Is this all right? Well, when you take the baby home, do you speak English to the child? Yeah, you do. But I, I want to tell you, your baby doesn't understand a word you're saying. The baby doesn't know English. Why are you speaking English to him when the baby doesn't know English? The baby couldn't pass an English exam. The baby couldn't pass the most rudimentary English exam. The baby would fail. F. <laughs> do over. The reason you speak English to a baby, and you do it the next day, and the next day, and the next day, is you want the baby to be a native speaker. You want the baby to be a native speaker. And the way you become a native speaker is by having it spoken to you years before you understand everything that's going on. And then we're going to wait to like 12 years to explain the grammar of it. That's just the natural process. We want the children in this congregation to grow up speaking the sacraments as native speakers. We want them to be native speakers. We do want them to love Jesus. We want them to understand the gospel. We want them to come to Christ. We want them to know that apart from faith, all of this is worse than useless. All the apparatus of Christian worship, hymns, Lord's table, baptism, pulpits, all of these things are worth, worse than useless. The prophet says, God cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. The more fancy it gets, the more ornate it gets. If there's iniquity there, God can't stand it. Away with the noise of your songs, he says. So we want to have a place where evangelical fire burns hot. But we want all the coals to be burning, including the little ones. We want all the coals to be welcome. We want everyone welcome. And we can do this. We can do this, Presbyterian and Baptist Together, if we agree to disagree, as we have done for a quarter of a century, we agree to disagree on the practice of baptism itself, but we want the culture of the church to welcome the little ones. Our Father and God, we know that in your sight, all of us are little ones. We know that we are all ignorant in so many ways. I pray that you would deal with the, that aspect of our ignorance that wants to exclude people that are a little more ignorant than we are. I pray that you'd help us to cultivate the attitude that, that Jesus displayed when he said, permit the children to come. Suffer the little children to come unto me. Father, we pray that we would be good representatives of your son in that respect. Father, as we pray, we would lift up the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, 
God in his great mercy has given you life in Christ. He's laid the table with the bread of life and the wine of relief. From this meal, we rise and go forth to living works, to love our spouse, to raise faithful children, to build decks, websites, and investment portfolios, to write books, make movies, compose songs, photograph sunsets, establish just laws, and fight lawlessness. All these good works, however, flow from the fountain of this table. We don't scrap and claw to earn enough approval from the Father to score an invite to this table. False gospels say that you, have, you must be good enough to come, but none of us are good enough to come, and all of our efforts to better ourselves only jam the gears even more. If you invert the doctrine of grace, you end up with a doctrine of dead works. Trying to do good works before receiving grace is like handing out blueprints for a cathedral in a graveyard. Corpses can't build cathedrals. They can only populate tombs. The gospel says, come without coin and buy bread. All of God's infinite grace is here. Your sins are forgiven. Your shame is washed away. Your vices are crucified and you bear them no more. Your virtues are resurrected and sanctified to his glory. The abundant riches of God's grace are all yours. All this is what gives rise to what some have called the Protestant work ethic. You can't earn what's on this table, but you can receive it in faith. And then, by God's grace, turn a profit on it. So receive grace in order to go forth with eager joy to do the works of grace. And then, in grateful praise, bring the fruits of grace to glorify God in the courts of his kingdom. So come in faith. And welcome to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The charge is this. We learn in the book of Acts from the words of the Apostle Peter that all the promises of God in Christ Jesus, all the promises of God are for you and your children. All the promises of God are for you and your children. So receive this benediction from Numbers with that in mind, with some insertions from me. The Lord bless you and keep you and your children. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and your children and be gracious to you and your children. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and your children and give you peace. Amen.